uh, let's don't, don't go down the ground as far. So uh, you only need to go down the ground maybe a foot, 16 inches. You know, we keep thinking we've got to go down four feet because of frost. Well, with, when foam came out, we can use foam as an insulator that go out four inches with foam. Instead, the frost tries to go underneath the foam and it can't get back far enough to hoist your house in the air. Now, as a good example for this, my house, I have wood foundation on about half of it. Half of it is frost-free foundation. And I'll show you a picture in a second. But so I have this thing that's down the ground. Mine's down the ground about this far. Coming across, hitting the foundation that's eight feet in the ground. Where they meet is right where in a hallway between, next to my kitchen and dining room, 12-inch ceramic tile. It's been there 10 years. Not one little crack, not any settling. If it's done correctly, these two different types of building methods you're not going to have problems with if it's done correctly. They hide that stuff in the directions. That's all you have to do is read the directions on how to do this. There's a capillary break, you know, stopping the moisture because of the rock. It's simple to do. And if you keep remembering one inch of, one inch of uh, foam is roughly the equivalent of 48 inches of soil. You could probably in southern Iowa get by with one inch of foam and not have ever, ever have any frost underneath there. But two is a lot safer because you never, you never know what's going to happen. And this is a combination system. House with the ICF foundation. And this is the early part of uh, um, the frost free. It's sitting right on the side. You just go, this, this particular house went down at, in the ground. Uh, this is, I think, about six more inches into the ground. Here's four inches of foam coming out perpendicular to the footing wall. What's that? Four foot of foam? Yep, four feet of foam. Theoretically, you can go two. I'm always just theoretically things. I don't mind putting the extra two feet out there. It's a lot easier than cutting anyway. So then we have the two inch foam on the outside. You pour your slab. And this particular slab was designed by Iowa State University. We had two inches of foam underneath it because we stained it a dark brown color. Had a lot of south facing glass. And we're using that basically for our heat sink. Kind of went. It's kind of fun to be able to go back in the old days where we had trom walls and all those things with solar. We, and we use everybody's foam so nobody gets mad at us. And then we put uh, re-rod. And in these areas right here, there's a one, one stick of uh, basically sewer pipe, plastic sewer pipe that comes out. So there's no chance of, uh, of any issues with rust or anything. And it actually comes out and goes to a vinyl boot to heat this part of the house. And then it's, and it's at a slight angle. So if we ever did have anything in there, we could pour a cleaner down the inside, catch it on the end. On the inside of the basement. And that's one of those cell high density foam. Yep, this is uh, 25 pound extruded polystyrene. I'm glad you brought that up. When you're looking at foams, don't, go, don't be looking at the sale because there's 15 pound and there's 25 pound. It has to be 25 pound density foam if you're going to have it in the ground or underneath the slab. So if you buy anything less than that, you're actually violating the building code. What about, you said you were going to talk later about insulating the wall? Yes. On those ducts that are heating and or cooling? Yes. Are those then independently insulated? Or? Yes, they're, they're independently insulated also. We actually, we kind of went nuts on it. We insulated it, we wrapped it with rock, and then we actually have two inches of foam, kind of a box around it also. It goes down across. So there's no way there's any, basically any heat loss. When we're looking at the building envelope, you know, that's basically when, when people mention that word, that's the outside of the house, you know, and as long as we, we know that moisture moves from more to less, that heat moves from warm to cold, uh, warm air rises, but heat radiates in all directions. You know, when somebody says heat rises, no, warm air does. Heat radiates in all directions. So we have to understand that a lot of times in these older houses, if we have any cold air, it's going to drop and displace the warm air. So if you have an uninsulated basement and it's kind of leaky, that cold air around that foundation is going to be coming in some holes, drop down to the basement floor, displaces the warm air, and then you get this effect where, you know, the basement's like 55 degrees, main floor is 70 where your thermostat's at, and it's like 80 in your second floor. And then you're pushing, you're pushing that air. And then you always get somebody that sells a great big attic ventilation system and now he's really helping you out because he's sucking all the air out of your attic pulling the air out of all the wires that go through all your walls pulling all the nice warm air that you just heated up and putting it outside so whenever you buy attic ventilation systems you know really think about uh, 
is my house made for that? And if you ever have any questions, you can always call over to the school. I love talking about attic ventilation. Um, building science, you know, that as long as you can take care of that capillary action, keeping water from moving through wood or moving through insulation, deflect the water away from the house. And I know it seems like I'm talking a lot about water, but if you don't take care of the water, your insulation doesn't work, your structure is going to fail. It all kind of comes back to that in Iowa. Drain it away. Allow it to dry. Uh, we can build walls now that are airtight, but yet vapor can go through, slowly go through the wall. You know, when we look at the old houses, 50s and 60s, why did the paint peel? Because the water vapor from inside the house traveled through the wall. The first thing it hit that it couldn't get through was the paint. My mom's house that they had in the 60s, dad always painted it gambles green, and it was about like, yuck. It was about like this. Mom painted like every year. Dad's always whining about cheap paint, cheap paint, cheap paint. And all it was was he didn't have a vapor retard on the inside. And the warm air went through the wall, bang, hit the paint and blew it off. And mom and dad go out there and paint it again because we didn't understand building science back then. So we have to allow these walls to dry. It has to be able to get through. And we want to use durable materials. Use advanced framing. Advanced framing was from the 40s. It's like pulling teeth when you talk to builders. And, and, and you know, luckily I can say, well, hey, I was a builder for 15 years, so don't give me any garbage. I mean, I know what you're fighting. But why don't you switch to advanced framing? Two stud corners. Why do we have 2x12s above a window that's this big? Why do we use 2x12 headers? Because that's what we've always done. You can use 2x4 headers. By code, you can use 2x4 headers for a window that's four feet wide. Why do we put headers on walls, exterior walls, that have a truss system above them carrying all the weight? They're not carrying any weight. None. But, well, that's what I've always done. We have to think. When we build at school, when those, when those students are laying out walls, so why is that piece of wood there? Well, it's because there's lines there. I don't mean it. That doesn't mean a thing. Why is that piece of wood there? You explain why that piece of wood is there, then I'll let you put it in. Just because I put a line there doesn't mean that's where it goes. They have to explain every little stinking piece of wood, whether it needs to be there or we can take it out. There's, uh, it's also called optimum value engineering. Um, you know, you examine each step. There's less, in, less materials or studs in the wall, so then there's more insulation, so you have a warmer wall. If you look at it with an infrared camera, you see less thermal bridging. Has anybody here ever had ghosting in a house where you have those warm dots? Nobody's going to admit to it, I bet. Okay. That's the cold coming through the wood, and it's cool enough on the inside surface that the dirt in the air, and we all have dirt in our, no matter what you do, the dirt in the air is it's circling around, hits that cool spot and condenses, and there's that little spot of dirt. Sometimes you can see every screw. Sometimes just on the top of the wall, it's a little dark. Maybe comes out on a rafter because that's thermal bridging. We have to stop that thermal bridging. And in Iowa, the easiest thing to do is get rid of the OSB sheeting on the outside, just use foam. We're way past having to use plywood and OSB sheeting on walls. When they say, oh, we need it for racking strength, no, you don't. Our, you know, you can use metal wind bracing. Why don't we go two foot on center? Because the drywall bends. Uh, when does it bend? There. It doesn't bend. Unless somebody gets thrown into it. it you know, if somebody gets thrown into a wall, it doesn't matter if it's five-eighths or half-inch. There's going to be a dent. So, you know, we have all these, always, we always come up with these excuses. Um, there's a lot fewer callbacks. If you frame with advanced framing methods, just type it in. Advanced framing techniques or optimum value engineering, you type that into any search engine and you'll come up with loads of, insul uh, loads of uh, pictures, diagrams, why it works. And you have warm corners. The old, well, I was taught to build framing and then throw fiberglass in it. Well, it worked good till we got a rain. Or the electrician came around, put his first wire in, wound it up like cotton candy, and then you wonder why that corner's cold. And where does usually mold form on a house? Inside corners, because there's no airflow there. And there's no insulation, and that's where we see the mold growing. So you're, you're looking at structural integrity, you're looking at warmer corners, you're looking at a better built house. And I threw this slide in, hopefully there was enough handouts. Um, if not, I can email you those. I threw this in there just to show you what permeability is. That's the, the ability for vapor to go back and forth through a material. You know, be able to let that wall dry out. This one right here, aluminum foil, 
That means this is about as close as you could possibly get to stopping moisture. What's on the outside of some of these uh, insulation boards on the outside of the house? Aluminum foil. So what's going to happen when that moisture gets there? It's trapped in the wall. can't get out. Uh, any of these aluminum things, like radiant barriers, if you're going to use a radiant barrier, I don't believe in them, but if you use a radiant barrier, it has to be up on the attic, has to have a half-inch airspace, and it has to be clean. Anybody that puts a radiant barrier down over your insulation in your attic, better ask why. Because where's the moisture going to go through if it goes through the room, goes through the ceiling, and it hits that aluminum? Yes? Is putting that insulation on the outside of your outside wall before your siding, is that going to create... Some the foam? Yeah. The foam actually is a little bit better than OSB. You know, there's, it's, it's a little bit... And we keep thinking, you know, we're always in this, we're fast-paced. You know, we think that vapor is going to like that. Well, it might take a month to get through. But it can get out. Where does it fall on this list? It falls in there at about one. A little, well, a little bit better than one. So it's, a, it's not really a vapor barrier. It's more of a vapor retarder. But yet it can still get through. But it's still better than OSB. Where does Tyvek fall? Tyvek is very, Tyvek is uh, about 50. Yeah, Tyvek's very permeable. Um, and this is what happens to a house when you put aluminum foil on the outside. If any of you guys are old like me, we used to put aluminum siding up. What well, was the first thing we did? Put that brown paper with the aluminum foil on it, staple it up. Ah, oh, here we go. Put a radiant barrier on the outside of the house, and then we'll throw our aluminum siding on. You take your aluminum siding off, and this is what you have, a rotted wall. If you're going to do a good framing job, insulate the wall up above. Insulate the band joist. And this is insulated on the outside. That's the best method is insulated on the outside. Then you can throw some fiberglass in here. But if you don't use foam up above and foam on the outside of this, this fiberglass is a great filter. And if there's plywood on the outside here, this fiberglass will keep this cold, warm air in here, go through, hit this, and condense. So, and if you don't believe that, go into a house where they threw fiberglass up in here when it's really cold out and then try to pull the insulation out. Usually you can't because it's frozen to the wood. So we want to keep everything on the inside of the foam warm. This is a two stud corner. It's always, well, how am I going to nail my, uh, my corner post on for vinyl siding? Okay, use a three stud. You can still get insulation in here. And why was this stud always here? Drywall. Okay. I think I took that one out. Sorry. Let me go back. All you have to do is use a drywall clip, a scrap piece of OSB or sh anything, or a stud right along this one, a flat. So you get insulation in. When you type in advanced frame, you're going to see about 20 different ways to frame a corner. As long as you can get insulation back in there, all of them are pretty good. But just because to hang drywall is a poor excuse. We use drywall corner bead. We nail it on that stud. This piece of sheetrock goes first, is floating. This one comes second, and it pinches it up against the corner bead, screwed in there. You'll never have a callback. If you've ever had build houses and had callbacks on, on corners, inside corners, of cracking in your drywall, all it is is two pieces of wood drying at different rates. That's all it is. You tell the homeowner it's just wood drying, they're not going to believe that. They're thinking their house is falling down. You have one stud there, you're not going to have any drywall cracks. And why did we always build corner posts? You know, interior partitions. No idea. Just put drywall corner bead on this side and this side and put one going across at four foot. It's just antiquated techniques. Why not go back to balloon framing? Why don't we balloon frame? You have to put blocking in a 10, yeah. Insulations, you know we found out fiberglass cellulose foams in walls. When we look at it from infrared camera, uh, we look at a temperature difference. If they're put in correctly, they're all working about the same. They really are. Once they're installed correctly, they're about the same. In fact, one of my instructors just finished a brand new house. He put fiberglass insulation, use certain teed membrane vapor retarder, it's a smart vapor retarder on the inside, one inch foam on the outside, 
His house is bigger than the guy across the street who used closed cell foam, and he's kicking the snot out of that guy across the street.